Hello everyone and welcome to Mexico City. If you are new to this channel, I'm David, nice to meet you, and I film brutally honest and somewhat humorous travel videos. However, I also film videos all about becoming a digital nomad, becoming location independent, and being able to generate an income while you travel. Now, in this video, I'm going to talk about my top 10 tips all about online teaching, which is becoming an increasingly popular route for aspiring digital nomads. Now, before we get started, you can check out a video in the description below and also up above all about the 120 hour TEFL, which I did a few months ago. I did a TEFL last year and this has allowed me to become an online teacher with italki. One of the common misconceptions about online teaching, especially for someone who's new to becoming a digital nomad, is that the only way you can do it is by becoming employed with a company based in China teaching Chinese children. And yes, this is an extremely popular route. There's a lot of demand. You know, it's a great way to get started. However, if you're like me, I don't really feel comfortable teaching children. I would rather teach adults. And italki is a great way in which you can do this. So point number one is all about your introductory video. Now, one of the things that you are required to do in order to become approved by italki as either a professional teacher or a community tutor rabbit, 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 rabbit. is to film and upload a introductory video. And this needs to be made up of three things, basically. Firstly, talk about yourself in terms of your qualifications, if applicable, for example, a TEFL, your experience, if applicable. You might not have any experience like I didn't have when I first started. Secondly, talk about yourself. Forget teaching, you know, talk about your interests, where you're from, that kind of thing, what you like doing, etc. And thirdly, the most important part, be very descriptive about what you can offer as a teacher, what you can do, what you can't do. Because, you know, when a potential student watches the video and thinks about booking a lesson with you, they need to have a clear idea about what to expect and about what you can actually offer them. One of the things about a video is that it can be quite daunting, especially if you don't have any experience speaking to a camera like I'm doing now. So practice makes perfect. And they don't need to be particularly long or extravagant or elaborate. That's great vocabulary, David. In terms of how the video looks, you know, if you have experience with video editing, that's great and you can create something a bit more elaborate. But if you don't, a video with a clear background, I know I don't have one now, but that's fine. You know, I filmed mine in a hostel in a dorm room in Bali, you know, but it works. It's fine. It's very simple. I speak clearly and it talks about what I can offer as a teacher. Point number two is all about being clear on your profile and description. So what do I mean by this? So one of the things you'll find when you start receiving lesson requests is that you'll get some slightly strange requests or, or things that you know you didn't really think about before you started teaching. You know, so for example, if you don't like to teach children, you need to say on your profile, I don't teach children, or I don't teach more than one student at a time, I don't teach groups, I don't accept lesson requests from parents in China that expect me to teach their children. You know, be really clear about what you can and what well, what you will do and what you won't do because the worst thing is if you start a lesson and they start talking about something or it's a situation in which you're not comfortable in and the lesson just doesn't work. So even though it might feel bad in yourself in terms of saying, I won't do this, I won't do that, in the long run, it's better because for you as a teacher, it's more comfortable. And in terms of the student, they're not wasting money on someone who isn't fully energized to give 100%. The third point is all about Penetration pricing, what is this? So one of the common questions I'm asked about italki is, how much do italki pay? Well, the fact is italki isn't a company where you are employed by them. You don't have a contract, there isn't a salary or a wage or anything like that. You set your own pricing. And one of the things which can be extremely challenging, I guess, when you start is the fact that on your profile, you will have zero lessons, zilch. You have no experience on italki. And when a student sees that, they're probably unlikely to book a lesson with you because of that fact. Secondly, if you're going to start off charging, you know, 25 US dollars without any lesson reviews or any experience on your profile, no one's going to book a lesson with you. So it's best to start low penetration pricing. So for example, I started at $10 an hour, which, you know, might not seem like a lot in the grander scheme of things. However, what it allowed me to do was to build up a base of students 
first, firstly, it enabled me to build up some reviews as well. So on your, on your profile, you will have the opportunity to post specific reviews. So you, know, you get some great reviews, you can highlight those so that potential students see them going forward. Once you have built up your base of students and you've built up your experience, et cetera, et cetera, you can raise your price. So, you know, what I do is raise my price every month, say by a dollar. You know, at some at one point in the future, I hope to get to about $25. You know, one thing as well with pricing is to look at, at other teachers and what other teachers are charging. You know, you get some people that have zero lessons, but they're charging $30 an hour. And that's the reason they are not getting any lessons because their price is too high. So, you know, do your research, think about what you could afford in terms of your cost of living, you know, be, re be realistic as well. So someone in a country that doesn't particularly have a great economy isn't gonna be able to afford to pay $50 for an hour lesson. Point number four is all about textbooks. Now this is a slightly emotional subject with some teachers. So when you have done your TEFL in the past or whatever you did to become qualified as an English teacher, you know, a lot of it is about a physical classroom teaching where you will have textbooks and things like that. However, the one thing I've learned is that I talk to students do not want textbooks. They do not want to do exercises. They do not want to learn from textbooks because they can do that in their own time. Or actually they've done it in the past at school or college or university where they have been learning English. They can do that in their own time. What they want from my talkie is conversation, speaking, speaking practice, speaking and listening, because on the whole, most people across the world, in terms of English learning, you know, the the reading and writing side of it has been covered at school, you know, grammar, etc., has been done at school, but actual speaking with a native speaker is something that they just don't have an opportunity to do, and that's what I talk is for. You might see some teachers that will teach from a textbook, and that's fine because some students will want that depending on the level they're at. So, for example, if someone is at a more beginner level and has a basic understanding of grammar, potentially a textbook or exercises might work for them. But in my experience and for all of the students I've got, generally most of them purely want conversation. So, you know, it's up to you. It depends what kind of teacher you are. It depends what kind of students you're looking for. OK, point number five is fail to plan, plan to fail. This is all about planning lessons. And this is often seen as a bit of a disadvantage in terms of italki and similar online learning platforms because with companies like Dada ABC, Chinese companies where you're teaching children, they will send you the material themselves, you know, so you don't have to worry about planning. But to be honest with you, this, it, it depends what kind of teacher you are. You know, I prefer to plan lessons for people in terms of the before, during, after lesson plan, which you may have learned in your TEFL may have, you should have. So you send some material to them beforehand, for example, a video, an article, a text, it might just be a list of vocabulary. Then you'll go through that in the lesson and then potentially you might give some homework afterwards. However, this is slightly difficult with speaking. And yes, planning lessons can take some time. However, it doesn't particularly need to be elaborate and extensive. You know, you can just find an article or maybe you have prepared some material yourself and you can just send that to them on Skype. And that's that, it's very quick. So, you know, if you have 20 lessons a week, yeah, it does take a bit of time to find the right material. Sometimes you might find something that might not be particularly relevant and think, oh, I'll go with it anyway, and then it doesn't work out. So I would say to try and take your time to plan, because if you don't plan, your lesson will be a complete catastrophe. You know, particularly if you're, with, if you're teaching someone that is maybe a more beginner, basic level, or maybe someone isn't particularly confident with their English and in terms of making a conversation, it can have awkward silences, etc. So always try and have as much material as possible for a lesson. Point number six is slightly related. This is about no extensive plans. Now, some teachers might have a strict lesson plan in terms of, you know, the first five minutes, we'll just have a quick catch up. The next half an hour, we'll go through some material, then we'll spend the rest of the time, you know, revising what we've learned. But to be honest with you, in my experience, and again, this is dependent on what type of teacher you are, 
I don't like to have a strict, extensive plan, you know, one that's written out on Google Docs and things like that. I very much like to play it by ear because often, you know, even though you might have material that they've sent to you, that, sorry, that you've sent to them, you know, something might have happened in their life that they want to talk about. And, you know, you might spend half an hour just talking about what's happened that in the last week. And that's great because it's, it's natural conversation. You know, it doesn't need to be strict and, you know, elaborate. It, you know, it can be just natural. Natural is great. So even though you might make a plan, sometimes the plan may not work out and you might just talk about something else and you might come back to that lesson plan another time. So all in all, don't worry, you know, play it by ear. You know, it's very much a two way thing. It's not just about you giving the lesson. It's also about what the student can bring to the lesson in terms of their speech and their listening, etc. Okay, point number seven is about trial lessons. Now, one thing that italki does offer students is the option to do a trial lesson with a teacher. They get three of them. That's the limit. So one of the common misconceptions is that trial lessons is for students to evaluate what a teacher is like. So you might think, that, oh, they'll be able to try an endless list of teachers until they find one that is suitable. But that's not what it's for. Trial lessons are for students to evaluate our talkie as a platform and see if it's right for them, basically. And, you know, one of the things you have to do in a trial lesson, which you'll know from your TEFL, is a needs analysis. Now, one of the things about needs analysis that I find is that many teachers will do it quite structured. You know, they might send a questionnaire to a student beforehand, things like that. But personally, and this is just me, it might be different for you, after 350 lessons now, roughly, it's become very natural, it's become second nature, you know. So generally, what I do, this may help, is the first 10 minutes or so, I will allow the student to introduce themselves. I'll encourage them to talk about things that they're interested in, you know, they like dancing, they like riding horses, they like dogs or cats, um, you know, and then I'll encourage them more importantly to talk about, in particular, their English ability and, you know, what they struggle with in their opinion, what they want to learn English for or improve their English for, you know, what's their motivation? Is it basic, general, everyday English? Is it for a particular reason? Are they moving to an English speaking country to work for an international company where English is the main language? etc. There's loads of different motivations. Then I'll ask them some questions on that. Then I'll do the same. So I'll tell them about myself and give them an opportunity to talk to me and ask me some questions. And this kind of does a couple of things. So firstly, it allows you to get to know each other, quite simply, as people. Number two, it allows you as the teacher to identify anything in their speech and their listening, which are potential aspects you could work on. So, you know, are their use of prepositions quite poor? Is their grammar quite basic? Are they messing up the tenses? Is their vocabulary quite basic? You know, could that improve? You know, and by doing all of that while they're talking and while you're talking, you can really, it, it can really help you, I guess, build a lesson plan. And it's really important that you work with them to build a lesson plan because one thing that that student might think is okay might not be right for someone else. Which brings me on to the next point. So point number eight, I'm running out of fingers by the way, so I'm not going to do that anymore, is the fact that every student is different. You know, one thing about teaching Chinese children is that generally they'll all be the same. You know, you'll hold up an apple or a banana and you'll teach those words, that kind of thing. But the thing about teaching adults, obviously it's very different from young learners, is the fact that everyone's different, you know, and people will want different things. The vast majority of my students want conversation practice, speaking and listening. Some may want business English, so we may look at things like business phrasal verbs and business idioms. Other people may be more focused on things like grammar because maybe they're slightly more beginner level. Other people may want help with preparation for IELTS exams, things like that. You know, so everyone's different. So this is why I kind of say that, you know, you shouldn't plan extensively because you know, everyone's going to be different. And sometimes, you know, one article that you might send Joe Blogs in one country, apologies for the use of Joe Blogs, may be completely irrelevant for someone else. So you very much have to have an open mind. You very much have to be adaptable to each student. And that's what I really love about Italki because every lesson is different. It never gets boring. Everyone is different and has a different background, wants to learn different things and has different motivations. So that is one reason I love italki. Everyone is different, does have that in your mind, and be conscious of that. 
Okay, we're almost there, we're on to point number nine. The ninth point is about using your personality. Now, this is, again, a slightly emotional subject because some teachers on italki believe they need to be this strict, hard teacher. Listen, you know, etc. Don't talk while I'm talking. But that's not what it's like in reality, at least in my opinion. You know, fair enough if you're in a, if you're in a classroom, a physical environment with young children where you do have to be strict, you do have to demonstrate discipline, that kind of thing. That's great. And, and you know, if you want to be like that and that's the kind of student you want to attract, that's fine. But for me, it's much more of a natural conversation. It's a relaxed environment, easy going. I'm relaxed, they're relaxed. Because what you've got to remember is that a lot of these people that are booking lessons with you will be shy, they'll be nervous, they'll be apprehensive, they'll need reassurance about their English level, etc. And, you know, if I was coming across as a strict teacher, telling them off and having a textbook, and it just wouldn't work for me. You know, the thing about italki and why students come to italki is to have natural conversations because that's where their English has been lacking in the past. They haven't had the opportunity to do that. And that's what's going to make the difference. You know, at the moment, I am in Mexico, as I said, and just through having basic conversations with people in Spanish, it's massively helping me. It's unbelievable how a natural conversation can help you out. So, you know, like I said, it's up to you, but use your personality. You know, don't be afraid to be laughy jokey and sometimes even say swear words because swear words are part of the English language. I have actually done le um, lessons on that. And, you know, be yourself, basically. You know, don't be a strict teacher. And point number 10, the last one, yes, I can use on my fingers, is about communication. The thing about italki is that you're teaching adults and they have a life, you know, they have a job, they have other commitments. And very often, sometimes they may need to reschedule lessons. They may have problems where you can't, where they can't get to a lesson, etc. So always have your phone on you, you know, be prepared to be logged into Skype 24 seven and reply to lessons Reply to lessons, reply to messages as soon as you get them. Similarly, you might get messages on italki as well. You know, also with lesson requests, you'll be getting lesson requests again 24 seven. And the quicker you can respond to that, the better, because if you don't respond for like two days, they might go elsewhere, you know, and generally this kind of adds to the easygoing, relaxed thing. You know, I say to all of my students, you know, if you ever have a problem or you can't get to a lesson or you need to change a lesson, I will be more than flexible. 100% um, because you know what you've got to remember as well is that you're an adult too as a teacher and you will have problems I've had power cuts I've been locked out of apartments you name it where I haven't been able to get to lessons I've been sick for the last two weeks with food poisoning but you know if you're upfront with your with your students and honest they'll be absolutely fine if you have a problem as well and you need to be fine with that too yes lovely so that's my 10 points on teaching online with italki. I know it was a bit long, but hopefully this will help you out if you're planning on doing the same thing. The last thing I just want to mention, which is really, really important, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, is about respect. You know, you've got to have respect in your students that, you know, think how they feel. That they're, they're not comfortable with the language. They're coming to italki to speak to a total stranger who is a native speaker, probably speaking very quickly, um, with obviously more advanced English than them. So they're gonna feel shy, they're gonna feel nervous, they're gonna feel scared, they're gonna feel apprehensive. You need to reassure them, put them at ease, and remember to encourage them, you know. And remember that at the end of the lessons, you know, don't just leave it and say bye. You know, it's really important that you remember to say, you've done a really good job today, particularly if there is something that they've massively improved on, because it makes such a difference for them, and they're motivated, they come back energized the next time. So. Yeah, just make sure you do that, all right? Think about how you would feel if you were learning a language. So I hope you found this useful. If you have, don't forget to leave a like, leave a comment, tell me all about your teaching online experience. I would love to hear, um, particularly the differences between teaching young learners, Chinese students, or adults. You know, what do you prefer? Tell me, I'd love to know. And don't forget to check out my other videos about becoming a digital nomad. There's literally about 20 of them at the time of recording, so you can see my journey from the beginning. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon. Catch you later.